joining us for uh, International Women's Day Breakfast 2020. And I have to commend all of you for sliding through the snow and being brave and hardy and uh, typical residents of Waterloo Region to make it here. I've been doing this since 1997. And I have to say, I look forward to every year because it's an amazing event that has a character and a personality of its own. Before we get started, I'd like to, a moment to acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional territory of the Atterwandan, Anishinaabeg, and the Haudenosaunee people. As we seek a renewal relationship based on the foundation of mutual understanding and respect. International Women's Day is a focal point <coughs> excuse me, in a movement for women's rights. It is a day that is recognized globally on March the 8th every year, and traditionally we've had this breakfast um, the preceding Friday. There are so many International Women's Day events that have already occurred and will occur over the weekend, and I encourage all of you to participate in them. Since the first International Women's Day in 1911, over one million people have supported the United Nations initiative. Again, thank you for being here to the, on this important day to celebrate the contributions and the ability of women to help create community. This year's theme for International Women's Day is Each for Equal, because an equal world is an enabled world. We can actively choose to challenge stereotypes, fight bias, broaden perspectives, improve situations, and celebrate women's achievements. Collectively, we help to create a gender equal world. This morning's event would not be possible without the continued support of our sponsors. So thank you to our title sponsor, BMO Bank of Montreal, events sponsors, Hefner Lexus and Hefner Toyota, Home Hardware Stores Limited, and Wilfrid Laurier University. The silver sponsor is Enbridge. Bronze sponsors are MTE Consultants and Walter Fady. Supporting sponsor, Kids Ability Foundation. Small business partner is the event firm. Design sponsor is Leslie Warren Design Group. Print sponsor, Westmount Signs and Printing. And our host for this morning, St. George Banquet Hall. Please join me in thanking our incredible partners. <clears throat> I'd like now to invite Rebecca Toscona, Regional President of Private Wealth, and Sherry Griffins, Regional President of Business Banking for BMO Bank of Montreal, to the stage to say a few words. Thank you so much. And fun fact, uh, my, my colleague Sherry is, I, I believe, circling the, the parking lot trying to find parking. So I'm delighted to be here uh, on behalf of all of us. BMO is very proud to sponsor this International Women's Day Breakfast. Uh, for those of you that I have not met, my name is Rebecca Tascona. I'm the Regional President for Private Wealth BMO Financial Group for Ontario. My colleague, Sherry, who is literally walking in the door, we did not... <laughs> We didn't plan it this way, but that's how this works. Sherry is the, uh, is the regional president for business banking, Bank of Montreal. I'm going to allow Sherry, if you wouldn't mind, come on up, take your coat off. Uh, and our other colleague, Debbie Chesneski, who's the regional vice president for personal and small business banking in Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge. Uh, International Women's Day is in part about elevating the conversation and taking action. And at BMO Financial Group, we are committed to this cause. We recognize the power of women, and one clear example that we can see uh, is in this room, uh, our Ontario leadership team. I'm so proud to work for an organization that realizes women are an economic force. Supporting the advancement of women internally and externally is something that we are passionate about. That's well. so crazy. <laughs> Thanks. And today we'd like to share a few of the initiatives that we've put in place at BMO. Sherry, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I don't even have glasses on. Um, so I'm, I'll just speak of some of the initiatives I'm fully aware of. I'm fortunate to be the sponsor of BMO for Women, so I get to do a lot of things like this, and Rebecca and I are both very passionate about it. One of the things I like to talk about is we announced about a year and a half ago that we set aside uh, $3 billion, just a little bit. <laughs> $3 billion in capital for women, uh, specifically women-owned businesses. And I'm happy to say we're about halfway through that. <laughs> so 
So we've already funded about $1.5 billion for women-owned businesses in Canada. That's a tr tremendous accomplishment and something we're really proud of. Um, something else that I know that is important to us is our purpose. And we really look at our purpose uh, boldly growing the good in business and life. And specifically with female entrepreneurs, we've doubled down on what that work is. So one thing I want to make sure that you look out for um, our BMO for Women site, if you haven't gone there, take a look. <laughs> but on Monday, you're going to see an example of something that really speaks to our commitment. And there's a really provocative video that you're going to see on that site that speaks to financial fairness. And I think, you know, if, if I think of all of us in the room and our experiences with money, I think being able to have those kind of conversations with women we know, with our daughters, uh, with our, you know, friends, family, I think those conversations are really important. So take a look at that video on Monday. Um, Rebecca and I would love feedback to hear what you think about it and certainly hope that the dialogue continues from that perspective. So, And maybe I'll just end. Yes, please. <laughs> Great job, Terry. Thank you. Uh, it goes without saying that we really value this sponsorship uh, and everything that it re represents. So thank you so much and back over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, going off script already, um, just parenthetically, two things. I learned as, when I was a brand new trustee that you always have to take your notes with you because somebody else may speak after you and take them away with them. So when you're at a podium, keep your notes with you. And that was such a demonstration on a Sherry um, and Rebecca's part of Real Poise. So thank you very much. Um, you can pivot and turn and walk out of a snowy parking lot and go on stage. Uh, well done, ladies. <laughs> I'd also like to extend an official welcome to uh, several dignitaries that, uh, like the rest of you, braved the elements to be here, and community members. And I would ask you to stand, and we will hold our applause to the end. Um, City of Kitchener, Mayor Barry Verbanovich. City of Waterloo, Mayor Dave Jaworski. We specialize in hard to say names around here. Township of Woolwich, Mayor Sandy Schantz. Former Mayor of Waterloo, Brenda Halloran. Chief of Police Brian Larkin, Waterloo Chief of Police Richard Heptich, um, fire chief. Fire. or Fire Chief, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, some, that's somewhat Freudian, and we will, Ch Chief uh, Larkin and I apologize, and we'll just drive past any implication of that slip up. <laughs> St. Mary's General Hospital President uh, Lee Fairclough, Lee's here. Um, City of Kitchener Councillors Margaret Johnson, Sarah Marsh, City of Waterloo Councillors Sandra Hamner, Jen Vasick, Regional Councillors Elizabeth Clark, Jim Erb, Tom Galloway, Township of Wil Wilmot Councillors Cheryl Gotchick, Angie Hallman, and Jen Fleming. F F Fenning, sorry. It's the silent P. Um, also from the Chamber's Board of Directors, Allison uh, Burke, uh, Oxford Learning Waterloo, and Kelly McManus, University of Waterloo, and Chair of the Chamber's Board of Directors. We should also acknowledge Ian McLean. Ian, you need to stand up too. I, I, I present these wonderful people to you. <laughs> Research has told us that if you have a critical mass of about 30% of women, that it changes the dynamics of a group. And we often look at the federal government, we look at provincial legislatures, at what the representation of women are. Tom, I, I emailed, I said you, didn't I? Tom Galloway? Uh, I want to really commend local elected politicians at the local level and the regional level. We have a critical mass of very involved women. Women that I think are changing the dial locally. And like so many things in life, closest to home is where you make the most impact. So the women that stood up, the ones that aren't here, but also the men that stood up that value the achievements and the contributions of women are what makes the difference. And maybe we just need to keep riding this wave of more female uh, representation at the local level. So thank you all for coming today and what you do for our community.
I would also like to acknowledge the Women's Leadership Committee who helps organize not only today's event, but a series of women's leadership events offered at the Chamber throughout the year. These women are here today and are wearing beautiful colored lanyards. A special thank you, and again, I would ask you to stand and hold your applause um, till the end. <coughs> Excuse me. Susan Cranston, Authentica Consul Consulting. Vice Chair Kim uh, Wilhelm, Food Bank of Waterloo Region. Rebecca Humphrey, uh, The Delivery Guys, Hempfee. Uh, Kat Kazaborkos, uh, Waterloo Regional District School Board. Sorry about that pronunciation. Nala Core, Core Capabilities. Kathy McDonald, Home Hardware Stores Limited. Janice McVie, The Dean Group. Amanda Melnick, uh, United Way Waterloo Region Communities. Rachel Summers, RBC, PH and N Investment Council. Sandra Stone, Karen Temple, BDO Canada LLP, and Leslie Warren, Leslie Warren Design Group. Thank you ladies for all you do at the Chamber. In honor of International Day's, uh, Women's Day, we are pleased once again to recognize our leaders of tomorrow with a special award presentation. There is a group of students from local high schools um, who maintain high grades, demonstrate exceptional leadership, while displaying an active commitment to volunteerism within the broader community. I would like to ask this impressive group of students to please stand so we can recognize you and your achievements. So this is where everybody from high school needs to stand so we can embarrass you. Thank you ladies for being here. After receiving several outstanding applications, a winner is chosen. Congratulations to the 2020 International Women's Day Leaders of Tomorrow Award recipient, Janice Wynn from Huron Heights Secondary School. Janice has achieved 96% average in grade 12 and numerous awards for math, science, and leadership skills. She co-founded Ignite Crew at her high school, which consists of a group of students giving back to the community. She is an active volunteer in the community, volunteering her time in a variety of organizations, totally over 1,700 hours of community service. As she makes her way to the stage to accept the award, but she's already here, and a $500 uh, bursary, um, please help me in congratulating Janice. Um, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be receiving this award. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to all the hardworking and resilient women in this community for encouraging young people like myself to strive for our goals. Thank you. Each year in the fall, Kitchener Waterloo Oktoberfest presents the Roger Women of the Year Awards, recognizing and paying tribute to outstanding women in our community across 10 categories. Nominations are now open, so we would encourage you to nominate someone you know. KW Oktoberfest also has generously donated a pair of tickets to attend the event in October. One seat was randomly selected at the start of this event, so if you have a paper butterfly at your seat, um, you are the lucky winner. Please come up to the side of the stage to receive your prize. This is skill testing, folks. Congratulations. <laughs> she's either just come back from the south or she's blushing. <laughs> oh, skiing. Oh, well, you got the weather for it today. Now I have the pleasure of introducing this morning's speakers. 
Sabrina Adair is an occupational therapist, mom of four children, CEO and founder of Enabling Adaptations, and is a passionate advocate for parents' empowerment. She worked in occupational therapy since 2003, serving in the private and public sector. She's also the owner of KW Custom Splinting and works as a professor at Conestoga College. Just last year, she started a new company to fill a gap that she noticed in the healthcare system. Enabling Adaptations created, was created as an online portal to help parents and caregivers act, give access to pediatric therapists. Through her own experiences, she understands the struggle of not getting access to services for children. This inspired her to create opportunities for others who feel supported in their parenting journey. So she created a home-based product called Scootlebox. Sabrina was the recipient of the 2019 MedTech Waterloo Top Startup Award and holds a post-professional Master's of Science in Occupational Therapy from Dalhousie University and a Bachelor's Degree in Occupational Therapy from the University of Buffalo. Um, welcome, I would ask you to come up. Our, our next speaker is Jessica Gerber, who works full-time alongside her parents at their on-farm meat store, Oak Ridge's Acres. Located just outside of Air, Oak Ridge Acre Country Meat Store provides a wide range of naturally and ethically raised meats. They also support over 40 local farmers and suppliers. 2020 marks Jessica's 10th year being part of the family business. She's a farm girl at heart and has a great passion for local food, farming, and the outdoors. She enjoys working with animals and has added her dog Ruby, two pot belly pigs, her cat Jack, and three pygmy goats to the menagerie of animals on the farm. When she isn't working, Jessica enjoys staying active, playing hockey and soccer year round. Please join me on stage, Jessica and Sabrina. So I noticed that you both wore pants. I heard that these are lower chairs. For anybody that was at a previous one where there were very high chairs, and the speaker and I both had short, tight skirts on, and we had to hop on and hop off. This is a better arrangement, trust me. <laughs> Ladies, thank you so much for being here and sharing your stories with us. So my first question, and um, you can decide or toss a coin who goes first. If I was interviewing the 13-year-old you, what would you have told me was your career path that you were planning on pursuing? <laughs> Serena? <laughs> um, so interestingly enough, when I was 13, I was very involved in helping people. So I knew I would have a career in helping people. If I go back to when I became an entrepreneur, I was really thinking about this over the week, and I had an interesting story because when my, my I'm youngest of five, and so my older brother delivered the free town paper. And at one point I thought it'd be really neat if I could have a few pennies to go to the, buy this, the, you know, the little treats at the store. And so I thought if I upscale the free paper and deliver it to their door, maybe they'd pay me for it. <laughs> so <laughs> I took his free paper and knocked on people's doors. <laughs> right? It's a great idea. That's and a I, banker clapping, just telling you. <laughs> I knocked on their doors and asked them for money, and surprisingly, a lot of people would pay me. So it wasn't until my parents found out about it and made me return most of the money. But, and then I decided, and then I would start selling things from my bedroom on the street to see if anybody wanted to buy that. So I think my entrepreneurial skills started very early in life. So you were going to be an entrepreneur, you're a serial entrepreneur, you just didn't know where it was going to lead you. Exactly. Jessica. Um, from a very young age, I actually um, was always very sure I was going to be a child and youth worker. So um, I've always had a huge passion for working with kids. And um, I did that um, from a very early age. There is five years in between myself and my brother. And unfortunately for him, that meant I could be his second mom for most <laughs> of his life. Um, but then, uh, yeah, I've always worked with children, but at 13 I was 
very sure I was going to do that for um, my life and I had all these visions of everything I could do and it actually, funnily enough, I was very sure I wanted to have some form of a retreat on a farm for children and youth and um, sort of halfway there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it's slightly changed over the years uh, for me, but child and youth work. So this is where panelists really grow to hate me. They'll galvanize, because this isn't a, a pre-planned question. But Jessica, what changed that you're not a child uh, and youth worker now? Uh, two very bad co-op experiences in college. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I did go to college for child and youth work, um, but yeah, too bad co-op experiences sort of was like, okay, I'll find another way to work with them. <laughs> so the next question is, what aspect of your job do you find most rewarding? So maybe we'll let Jessica continue. This was uh, one I really had many answers to. Um, I think for me, just working with um, our customer base, we're very fortunate to um, have a very loyal customer base. And after many, many years of owning and running our business, we've really built up some very amazing relationships with our customers. And um, being able to be a part of um, just people's lives and seeing um, how we can affect their lives and it, vice versa, how they've uh, impacted us has been probably one of the most rewarding parts of the job. And then just personally, um, coming from a very close-knit family, being able to work with my parents on a daily basis, not everybody can say that, but <laughs> um, thankfully we live 200 feet away from each other, so we do have a bit of a break. But. Uh, yeah, working with my parents would be probably the other part of it. Now, not everybody has been to uh, your store. Can you talk just a little bit? I, I was fascinated with the ready-made frozen um, variety of food that you provide. I think that creates a real linkage to the people that are your patrons. Yeah, so um, we're like a very small uh, grocery store but located on a farm. And... Uh, we started with just our own beef that we sell, and now we're up to about 45 local uh, farmers and producers that we sell their product. But yes, uh, probably a good chunk of our business is our pre-made, ready-to-go dinners that we make all in-house from scratch with all of our meats and produce you can also buy in our store. And um, that has definitely hit home for a lot of um, our family customers as um, running a family is a very busy job in itself and then um, typically you have a very full-time busy job on top of that so being able to whip in at night and uh, grab a fresh meal that you just can take home and heat up is yeah become a more and more uh, popular item in our store and speaking of busy lives <laughs> uh, what is aspect of your job is most rewarding um, I want to just make sure everybody knows what an occupational therapist is, because that seems to be something that people don't often know. So an occupational therapist is somebody who takes the aspects of your lives that you're having trouble with and can help you break it down into more manageable, simple aspects. And if you are struggling with one part of it, we can help you find alternative solutions to it. So it's a very broad profession, um, and it's given me the ability over the years to work with a lot of different populations. What's most rewarding about my job now is that I'm having the ability to work with parents to be able to look at their children slightly differently. And so um, what I do is I, I for parents, we sometimes forget what it was like to learn something new. So if you go back and try and remember, you know, even tying your shoe, it's hard to remember those skills that you needed in order to tie your shoe. It's the same thing once you learn to ride a bike, right? You just, you don't remember the struggle it was to learn how to ride a bike. Um, and every child is so different, and I'm sure Karen can attest to this with her four children. My four children, not one of them is the same. Mm -hmm. Not one of them learn the same, not one of them acts the same, reacts the same. And once you think it, you have it down, the next one just throws you for a whole loop, right? 
Constant learning. <laughs> yeah, so in a few things, like, and I, and I would ask Karen too, some things that people forget is even when you're trying to go to bed at night and you want to relax at the end of the day, like what's something that you do at night to help you relax before you go to bed? As an adult or what I did as a parent? As an adult. <laughs> um, as an adult, I really do believe um, very much like dealing with children, it's, it's some kind of predictable routine. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, make sure that you scrub the day off your face, that you brush your teeth, but get into bed. And I usually try to read or um, think about what the day was like. Because, you know, so many of us live really fast-paced lives, and all of my colleagues that are in public life, I think, will agree with it. And it's just so often you forget those little moments, those little uh, spots of joy. Um, so I really try not to dwell on the to-do list or what didn't go right, but think about the memorable things in that day. Uh, and then I try to read and I usually get like two pages into it and fall asleep. And, and so sometimes we don't realize that to, for her to get to that point where she could feel relaxed by reading, she could put the day aside, wash her face off, we forget that that took trial and error. And so when we look at our kids and our kids are having troubles falling asleep, we sometimes forget that they haven't learned what works for them yet. They haven't learned those routines. And as parents, we need to teach them those routines or we need to work through those routines and break it down. You know, some kids need to have, you know, heavy weights on them. I met a group of moms and some moms had to wear socks to bed. Some moms had to wear, um, have a light blanket just touching their face up to their nose but not past their nose. And, <laughs> you know, some people need noisemakers and some people need lights on and hot and cold and, you know, it, it goes on. But how we figured out how to get to that is very different as an adult and we forget that our kids are learning how to get that. So what's most rewarding for me is having those aha moments with parents to be like, oh, Yes, we need to help them. And we need to look at all the environments, the sounds, the noises, the smells, the touches, all those things that we are going to teach our kids, this is what's going to calm you. And so that's the aha moment that I, I, and the rewarding part when parents are like, oh, yes, and then you look at your child just slightly differently. And so I challenge all of you to go home and work with your children or children you work with. If they're not acting right, they're trying to figure out the world around them. That's so insightful, and uh, I think you're right. Uh, the other thing I always like to say um, to parents, and I remember being a parent of young children, kids always get you, give you a second chance to be a better parent. And I, I'm not talking about abuse, abuse here. I'm just talking about, you know, when, when you lose patience with them. And I found in our kids, the things that aggravated me the most were the things that I see in myself that I don't like. And you see it in your kids and go, hmm, got to curb that. <laughs> I, my mother's advice was always go and look at your children when they're sleeping because every child looks like an angel when they're asleep. And you forget all the bad stuff and you go, oh, they're so cute. <laughs> um, often successful people have had help along the way, either a mentor, an uh, investor, or a champion. Does anyone fit that description in, in your career path and how did they help? So Jessica, do you want to take this one or should we? Yeah, sure. Um, I've been very fortunate to have um, a number of mentors in my life that have really helped um, both shape me to the person that I am and just help with um, getting me to where I've gotten in life. And um, two very strong-willed women are part of that. And then um, my father is uh, the third one for that. So I was fortunate enough to have an extremely close relationship with my grandmother growing up. And um, she was a very strong-willed, independent woman who um, at 17 gave birth to her first child and um, started her own business and yeah, just paved her own path in life and did not conform to any of the boxes that were set in front of her. Um, was a very, very successful woman. And she passed a lot of those traits on to my mother, uh, who I also um, have an exceptionally close relationship with. So those two women have um, definitely been a huge role models in my life and being both entrepreneurs themselves have really uh, showed me and taught me many, many things in life I never really thought about growing up. You're like, oh, I'll just do this. And then you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. OK. Um, and then my dad also came from a family business and 
uh, has a very different way of thinking than my mother, but uh, together watching them uh, be a team and run our business together and our firm and yeah, just seeing the mutual respect for each other in there has um, taught me a lot as well. So yeah, those would be the three mentors. If there's any investors that want to be part of it, I would uh, welcome you. <laughs> but as of right now, no investors. <laughs> um, would you describe yourself as an entrepreneur? Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the right answer. <laughs> yes, I would. Uh, now I would. Bef um, when I started out at our business, um, it was just a, hey, mom and dad, I dropped out of college. Can I work for you for a bit? <laughs> um, not entrepreneur. Uh, and here I am 10 years later, and then I would definitely answer that question as yes. I think it's really important too. How many people, this was a show of hands, how many people here knew their grandmothers or grandfathers for that particularly well had, had a real influence on them? I think it's really important to realize that as much as we're trying to break that glass ceiling and reinvent um, how we look at the contributions and the abilities and the ambition that exists in women, and I think society does not embrace or acknowledge ambition in women quite the way they do in men, and I think that's wrong. I think that is one of the impediments, that there are people who came before us by generations of women, whether they were doctors or they didn't just, as you said, Jessica, tick the boxes off, but they actually lived a life that followed a path and a career that spoke to their passions. My, I grew up next door to my Italian grandparents and my grandfather was an entrepreneur, but my grandmother was too in her own right. She used to save up money and buy stores on Young Street in Toronto. And at the end of their lives, my grandmother in her own right was worth as much money as my grandfather. And not that that's the test of a successful life, but it is one of the parameters. And she just quietly went about doing her business. So. Um, there have been pioneers before us, there are pioneers amongst us, and maybe the table of those wonderful young high school students at the end of the room will be pioneers as they go forward. There's still room to be the first something. Sabrina. I think my story is a bit differently different, um, and I want to challenge people too. I always had hoped to have that person that would champion me, and I realized that along the path, you have people that work for you that kind of push you through on your journey um, and you have people that don't and I often actually look at those people that don't as pivotal points in my life that actually made me change and so they weren't listening mentors in the way that they probably were expecting but if I hadn't harnessed the energy from those negative experiences and those negative influences in my life and really put it towards how can we make this a better opportunity for people I don't think I'd be where I am today so I think it was a combination of taking those experiences, both positive and negative, and also looking at people who don't even know I exist, but because our internet is fantastic, to see people that have taken and championed um, their passions, championed for other people, for you know, less privileged, and you know, use them as my mentors to say, if they can do it, I can do it. Have you, you're a very um, wise person beyond your years, I know, and. Uh, just speaking a little bit introspectively, what is it in you or your um, life path or the people that influenced you that allowed you to take those bad experiences and say, what do I learn from them and how do I move on? Because that's pivotal. We all hit roadblocks. We all hit do not go um, this way and we have to pivot. Have you thought about what it is in you that has allowed you to say, hmm, I can do better and not just be stopped in your tracks? I think part of it, I have come from a line of entrepreneurs, um, is very male dominated side of entrepreneurs, so it was never really pushed on the female side. Um, but I always saw people that took on challenges. And I never could sit well with a system that wasn't providing the best for the people. So I worked in the hospital system, I've worked in the school system, I've worked in the community system. And every time I'd always come up with, why are we doing it this way? Like, it, it just didn't make sense. And the answer was always to me, because that's how we've always done it. And to me, that was so discouraging, because it's like, 
but it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that our kids are waiting for services. It doesn't make sense that, you know, seniors can't get help in the home. It doesn't make sense. So when I came to that, I was like, and then he said, well, you know, it's just too hard of a problem to change. And I don't know where it is in me, but I'm like, it's never too hard. It just requires somebody to change it and somebody to stand up and be that pivotal point. So on a small scale, my kid's school had a really bad parking lot, horrible parking lot. And somebody came up to me and said, oh, don't even bother. There's no way you can change it. And I, my answer to them was, watch me. And so within a matter of three months, I, had, I went to Kitchener City Hall. I had my plans drawn by somebody. I, stood there in line, paid my dues, and got the approved, presented them with a plan, and now the parking lot has changed. It's one of those things I think it drives, increases my energy. Thank you. I want people to have a better life. And so if I am not going to change it, who is? And so if I start it now, and I always say that you plant the seeds now for a future you may never see, but if I can plant these seeds for my kids' future, then that's what I'm here for. It's great. Um, what advice would you give somebody following in your footsteps? Jessica, do you want to take this one on? Oh. Um, <laughs> probably just the main thing would be don't be afraid to take risks and um, failure is okay and um, just, yeah, it takes a lot of work and um, a lot of talking, or for me at least, it took a lot of talking to myself to get it through because it's a very humbling experience um, when you uh, have two very successful parents and you go to them and tell them that you've decided to drop out of college. Um, it uh, <laughs> took a few weeks to work up the nerve to say that to them. But uh, to me, that was such a huge failure, and I was letting my parents down, and um, just accepting that it actually wasn't. It just meant that, that what I had always planned as my plan in life just wasn't actually to be my plan in life, and that is totally fine. Uh, changes in life are expected, <laughs> and they come out whether you want them or not, and to just ride out that wave and um, yeah, just keep powering through. If there is a box that you don't like that people are putting around you, don't be afraid to uh, step out of it because it is scary, um, but you will always find somebody that will be behind you 110% and um, really encourage you to just keep on walking. So. Yeah, don't be afraid to take risks, step outside of the box, and just keep on going. I really think um, sharing the fact that you were on one trajectory and said, no, this is not for me, I've had two placements and, and they didn't go well. Um, part of the art in life is figuring out what you don't want to do. It's where your passion lies and what you want to follow, but it's perfectly legitimate to go, I did X and it's just not working for me. I'm really interested, how did your parents react? So you screwed up all this courage to tell them something that you've already decided, so you're not asking their permission, you're telling them. What was the reaction? Was it what you expected? Yes and no. My dad is a very silent man of few words, and that is exactly what he did, sitting there staring at me. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, he's either excessively angry or he's just letting this sink in for a second. And um, my mom, being herself, was okay. Um, so what's next? Okay, I haven't got that far. Uh, <laughs> I'm just now at the point that I'm telling you that this is happening. So, um, but yeah, it, I think it took naturally like a day or so to just process that that is um, what their oldest was telling them. And, uh, but yeah, they both came around and it's, hey, if you're not happy and stuff like that, that's, we're not gonna ask you to continue going down that path. So then um, you're just trying to figure out and it took some time to see what I wanted to do, but in the meantime started working for them and 
yeah, it's all worked out so far. <laughs> So this is a little known fact. Um, uh, one of our daughters, our daughter-in-law, my sister-in-law is here. They know this story. But I started out at the University of Toronto in occupational therapy. I did. And very excited about the prospects. Switched um, after first year to be an English major. And halfway through that year, decided to drop out of university. So I went home and told my Italian father and my very supportive mother that, um, you know what, I just thought I was gonna look for something else to do that wasn't quite uh, panning out the way I thought it was going to. And my dad took me into this little room which was our den and had a piano, it was all dark wood, and he said, you see that wall? And there's nothing on the wall. I said, yeah, it's a wall. And he said, well, at the end of the day, I want some kind of diploma up there, <laughs> or your head. <laughs> And he said, I, I, I think parenthetically what he was trying to say is, you know, to who much is given, much is expected, but that he wasn't that eloquent. And he said, I'm fine that you don't want to be an occupational therapist. I'm fine that, that you think you have tea at this juncture in your life isn't okay, but you're not going to be a quitter. So you figure out what you want to do and you pursue something and I expect big things. Now, politics was not on the horizon, but I want you to know that I did go on and finish my degree and subsequently got a master's in poli-sci. And dad was very, very proud, but he just was determined that you had to have a trajectory that you had some kind of control over. Um, I often think that having two older sisters contributed to the high expectations my dad had for us as girls, because he was a, a very old-fashioned Italian, and I think that had there been a brother, he would have seen that star shining because we only had girls he expected a lot of each of us so um, I totally empathize with going home and going I have something to tell you <laughs> it's when you ask your parents to go in the living room and go we need to have a talk <laughs> Sabrina so if I could give someone a piece of advice it would be that the road is hard uh, it's not been easy and, but I would say that you do have to take up every opportunity that you can get in the path that you want to go. And I'm going to say that sometimes the door is wide open for you and you walk right through it. Like this event was great. It was a phone call and I was like, sure, yes, I'll do that. Um, sometimes it's like a little window crack and sometimes it's like you're jamming your fingers into the door to pry yourself into events and, you know, get where you want to go. And so it's not always easy. It's not always, you know, rose-colored glasses or however this, this saying goes. Um, but I say that it's worth the challenge. As long as you know what your vision is, what you see for the future, what you want, and lots of people have told me not to go there. Lots of people have said it's not somewhere that's possible, you're not gonna change in your lifetime, it's not worth it, focus on your kids, focus on your family. Um, but yet I see a better tomorrow. And I think we do need to rise up and take those challenges and do stick our fingers in the door sometimes. It does hurt. But the door's not shut then. I really like the analogy. Um, Sabrina, how big a role did education play in your success and experience? So I, I did finish my degree in occupational therapy, so <laughs> <laughs> it did. Overachiever, clearly. <laughs> Um, and I did go back to get my master's, so right now it is a master's program, but I went back and got my master's so that I could accomplish more with my degree. Um, I think that played a large part in giving me the overall perspective of life, because it does teach you how to look at people, how to look at their environment, how to look at the things that they do in a very different way. Um, so if you talk to an OT, they kind of judge you holistically, which is like, you know, you, it's the big picture. Um, but having said that, I became a much better OT when I went through life, right? When I worked in the hospital with people, my dad had double bypass, he's had bilateral hip surgeries. Helping him through that as a family member has been very different. Um, and now, specifically with my kids, so I, I have four kids, 12, 9, 7, and 5, very young. And, um, but they all have different challenges that have made me realize more about me as a mom and also about me working with other parents. Like parenting in itself is hard. There's nothing I don't think that prepares you for it, but that it just makes you realize um, about life a bit differently. Like the schedules, the busyness, everything about it. And so I think the experiences of that has now made me a better occupational therapist. So Jessica, you've already plumbed a little bit of the depths of your education. Education experience, how have they uh, balanced out in propelling you to what you're doing now? Um, 
Yeah, surprisingly, a lot of my uh, programs for child and youth work have come in very handy in my job, which I never really would have thought that being very customer service driven now would equate to um, my behavior management class or my, uh, <laughs> yeah, classes along those lines. But um, we have, we're fortunate to have uh, an amazing amount of families that shop at our store. And of those families, a uh, massive amount that have uh, children on the autism spectrum uh, or some other form of learning disability or any of those um, type of things that my education has actually helped me be able to either communicate with those children a little better or just understand where they're coming from. So um, I can think of one of our customers' children. Uh, she's uh, on the autism and knowing when she comes in on a Saturday that all the lights and the noises are a little much for her. So we have a corner chair that she always goes to. She grabs her cookie, she grabs her juice box, and she goes there and sits. And But now we've learned how to say hi to each other and we're good and stuff like that. But it's those little things that um, you don't really realize how big a small gesture can be to somebody until um, you do it and then you have a very appreciative father or something that comes and just says thank you. So education, my education, even though I don't have a certificate behind it, it has played a massive part in my daily life. So we're racing against the clock right now. So I'm going to go to the last question, which I want you to know that both panelists said that they would like to answer. And so if you wanted everyone to leave with one message from you today, um, what would it be? And Sabrina, we'll start with you. I think with my new company, my biggest thing is trying to empower parents. So empowering parents to know that you are capable of helping your children, you are capable of doing more with your children. Um, Right now we have such a long wait for services in the school board, so it's up to seven years for some kids to see an occupational therapist. So grade one, they won't see somebody till grade seven. Um, but in that time period, there is so much that parents can do. And I want to really challenge people to look at yourself and know that you are capable. Like you are capable once you're educated, once you know what you're able to do. Um, and I want you to know that by taking on that role, you not only are changing the future for your children, but you're changing the future for the world because those are the, that's our future, are those kids. And we need to support them as much as possible. Jessica. Sort of just to build on what Sabrina said is just, um, yeah, I would really encourage you uh, to find um, your capabilities and if it's um, something that is a little nerve-wracking because it's not the number one thing that you're supposed to do. Um, like I'm a 32-year-old female farmer. It's not a number one occupation for my age group and uh, specifically females. Um, but it's something that I have a passion for. It's something I do have to work at when you go to a beef farmer's convention. Um, not a whole lot of females, uh, but it just, yeah, don't be afraid, like I said earlier, don't be afraid to step out of the box and create your own path, and I just really encourage you to do so, and yeah, just pave the way. There's always going to be somebody watching you, and um, thinking uh, that is awesome, and yeah, I would just encourage you to just find your capability, find your passion, and just go for it. So we're out of time, but I want to thank both Sabrina and Jessica for being amazing panelists. Um, and I would like to invite uh, Kelly McManus, who is chair of the Chamber of Board of Directors on stage, to um, say thank you to our speakers.
And I know we're all making the mass exodus out to that exciting parking lot and not sure what we're uh, in store for us, but I, I do want to uh, certainly share my delight in being here uh, this morning. And on a personal note, uh, I did take great pride in being the fifth consecutive female board chair of the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Uh, Sabrina and Jessica, thank you for sharing your stories with us this morning. You exemplify the spirit of entrepreneurship and resilience, that signature of our community and of women in general. We have so much to offer and celebrate, and we must remember to embody this year-round, not just on International Women's Day. Karen, thank you for sharing this morning with us and for once again being a fantastic host. This truly is a hallmark event in our community each year and the Chamber is grateful for your continued leadership. And so on behalf of the Chamber, we'd like to present you all with a small token of our appreciation. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Sabrina and Jessica. It was another fantastic event. Um, I feel inspired. Does everybody else in the room? Thank you again to today's sponsors. Uh, title sponsor, uh, BMO Bank of Montreal, Hefner Lexus and Hefner Toyota Home Hardware Stores Limited and Wilfrid Laurier University, who were event sponsors. Enbridge, who was our silver sponsor. Bronze sponsors, WTE Consultants and Walter Fady. Kids Ability Foundation for a supporting sponsorship. Um, the event firm for a small business partner. Leslie Warren Design Group, our design sponsor. Westmount Signs and Printing, our print sponsor, and our host, St. George's Banquet Hall. The Chamber hosts several events throughout the year, specifically for women in business, including an upcoming luncheon that will soon be announced for early June, and the inspiring women's event on Thursday, September the 17th. We also encourage you to join us at the KW Titans game on Thursday, April the 2nd, where we'll be celebrating women in sport. If you use the code women in sport when booking, you can take advantage of the buy one, get one free offer. Visit greaterkwchamber.com for full event details. Finally, thank you for joining us this morning and celebrating the success and the collaboration of women in our community. I hope in one way or another, you were inspired by the conversation that was shared here today. Enjoy your day and celebrate the women in your life. Have a safe trip and a great day.